You're listening to the Mens Rea Podcast, and this is the story of the Carrie Babies. On Saturday the 14th of April, 1984, a man was jogging on the White Strand Beach, three miles from Caersyveen, County Kerry, on the southwestern coast of Ireland. He was a local cattle farmer. At around half past eight, he jogged past a number of empty fertilizer bags, strewn on the rocks at the strand, and what looked to be a doll. On his way back, he looked again and realised that he had stumbled across the body of a dead infant, which was wedged between the rocks at the shoreline. It was the body of a little baby boy. A post-mortem of the baby's body, known as Baby C, concluded that he was less than two days old, and he had been strangled and stabbed 28 times before being disposed of in the sea. Dr. John Harbison, the chief state pathologist, pronounced that this was a murder, and a guard investigation began. The guardi began questioning the local communities to see who had been pregnant in the area and may have given birth to the Cahersivine baby. The town was small, with less than 2,000 people living there. The guards questioned everyone they could think of, school children and people known to be having affairs, each family was given a questionnaire to fill out. Eventually, they began to look beyond the immediate village, and local hippies living nearby as well as members of the travelling community were visited. Anyone that was doing anything that didn't quite fit into the social norms and may have recently had a baby, or had been pregnant, was investigated. In the second week of the investigation, Gardy from Dublin, who were members of what became known as the Murder Squad, were sent down to help investigate. They were from a team of Gardaí who dealt mainly with murder and became known for their heavy-handedness as a tactic to get information that they wanted from witnesses and suspects. The guards then called the organisation Cura, who are a Catholic crisis pregnancy agency, but they couldn't help and had no information. They then called the Bon Secours Hospital, but again, there was no joy. Finally, they called St. Catherine's Hospital, who told them about three unmarried women who had been in the maternity ward of the hospital recently. Two of the women were checked and eliminated from the investigation. The third woman was Joanne Hines. She had attended the hospital on the same day that the Cahersivine baby had been found and had had a scan, the report of which read, quote, uterus recently emptied, end quote. When Joanne had attended the hospital, she told the doctors that she had not given birth, despite two scans showing that she recently had had a child. And at this time, it wasn't unheard of for women to attend the hospital after a home birth gone wrong. Usually, after some time, they would confess that the baby had been stillborn or had died shortly after birth. Joanne was in the maternity ward of the hospital for six days. She was treated and spoke to the hospital chaplain in confidence. Her mood seemed to lift after that. And then she went home. Her doctor, Dr. Sheehan, thought that the police were on the wrong track and that Joanne had not presented as a woman that had killed her newborn baby. He thought that if police were to go and look at her family farm in Abbey Dorney, they would likely find her baby there and find that she was one of those unfortunate women whose baby had been born dead. The team from Dublin liaised with the local guard, Liam Maloney, who confirmed that Joanne had in fact been pregnant, but that he had been told that she had miscarried in hospital. Garda Maloney even rang Joanne's cousin to confirm that this was the case. But this obviously wasn't true, given the hospital reports that had been given to the Gardaí by Dr Sheehan at St Catherine's. Abbey Dorney is a small farming village north of Tralee, not too far from the Atlantic coast, and at the time there were less than 200 families living there. The Hayes family lived two miles south of the village proper, on a small family farm. There were two houses on the 36 acres. The old farmhouse, where most of the family tended to congregate, despite its lack of modern facilities such as running water and heating. And there was a newer, two-storey house built by the county council to house one branch of the family that had had children. There were three generations living in the house. Joanne's mother and her sister, Joanne's own siblings, and Joanne's own child, Yvonne. The farm was run by Joanne's brother, Mike, and he was joined by her other brother, Ned, when he was made redundant in 1982. Her sister Kathleen had worked in an office in Tralee until that year, when she was also made redundant. She then took on the mantle of main homemaker. Aunt Bridie had been a nurse in the local hospital, but had retired early, in the late 60s, due to ill health. She drank a bit too much. She also owned the family's only car, but the two brothers did the driving. Joanne worked in the reception of a sports and leisure club that had opened in 1977. By the time the Cahersivine baby was discovered, Joanne was the only member of the Hayes family that was getting a paycheck. Her social life revolved entirely around the sports centre. She was introverted by nature, but loved children and was good with them when they would come into the centre. Initially, she would interact with her colleagues very little, but eventually she started to join them after work for drinks in a local hotel. If the night went on late, she and the other receptionist would get a lift home with Jeremiah Locke. Eventually, she started to tell the girl she worked with about a relationship that she was having. 
She never told them who she was with, but she didn't need to. They knew it was with Jeremiah Locke, who had been married only six months before the relationship with Joanne had started. Joanne and some other employees at the sports complex had even attended Jer and Mary Locke's wedding months earlier. Though no one spoke about the affair, everyone knew about it. Joanne and Jer were not discreet and spent a lot of time together at work, engaging in horseplay or even having blazing rows in front of their colleagues. Eventually, word got back to Mary Locke, and in May of 1982, she arrived at the door of the Hayes farmhouse with two other women, her mother-in-law and her sister. Kathleen and her mother Mary listened at the door while the other two women gave out and told them to warn Joanne off a man named Jer Locke. Mary and Kathleen could not deny that Joanne was having an affair. On the way to the house, the three women had found Joanne down the road from the house, in a car with Jeremiah Locke, and they had pulled her out of it. Neither Joanne nor Jeremiah returned to their respective homes that night. Mary Locke was eight months pregnant by the time she appeared at the Hayes' door. She had her baby on the 25th of June, 1982, and Joanne miscarried her first child by Jer Locke just five days later. She had promised to give up her relationship with him after the incident at the door, and after he had gone back to his wife the next day. But their relationship continued. She had promised to stay away from him, but she also relied on him to get her to and from work. Her brother Ned said that he would give her lifts in, but eventually Joanne fobbed him off and said she didn't need him to pick her up. Joanne was quickly pregnant by Jeremiah Locke again. But Joanne was happy. She thought that Jeremiah would eventually leave his wife for her. Her family, on the other hand, was less than thrilled about the pregnancy. They knew how hard things were going to be for her. She had stepped outside what was considered to be socially acceptable in so many ways, by involving herself with a married man, and by becoming pregnant by him. The family kept their peace, however, and did their best to support her in the most typically Irish of ways. They simply did not speak of it. Joanne and Jer's baby was born on the 19th of May, 1983. Joanne named her Yvonne. The family and neighbours put their effort into doting on the child, rather than worrying about how she had come about, and Yvonne soon became the focal point of the family. But despite the affection shown to her, the family still disapproved of Joanne and Jer's relationship so much so that one member of the family approached Garda Maloney and asked him to try and speak to Joanne and talk her out of continuing the relationship. But this didn't work, and three months later, Joanne was pregnant again. She continued the relationship with Jer until the 23rd of December, when she found out that his wife Mary was also pregnant again. She had gone out with work for a few drinks after finishing her Christmas shopping, and one of the women she worked with told her that Mary was expecting again. Her workmates all knew about the affair and generally said nothing about it. This time, though, her friend thought that Joanne ought to know that it was unlikely that Jer was going to leave his wife for her and that maybe Joanne would be better off without him. Joanne was so upset that she fled the pub and she left her packages behind her. The relationship was over. On the 13th of April, 1984, Joanne's son, whom she would have named Shane, was born and died. A few weeks later, on the 25th of April, Mary Locke's second child was born. Joanne had not told her family that she was pregnant again, and though some in the house suspected as much, the topic was not broached. No one really knew what to say. She had seen her family doctor with Yvonne regularly, and had been, as recently as the week previously, about an operation for Yvonne's thumb, and the doctor didn't notice that Joanne was pregnant, nor did his partner in the practice notice that she had been pregnant the day after she gave birth. The night of the 13th, she had left the house in the evening saying she needed some air, and returned some time later, bleeding. She told her sister that she was having a heavy period. Precisely what happened that night is still unknown. Her cousin was eventually called, who brought Joanne back to her house, and eventually the doctor was contacted, and then the next day, Joanne went into the hospital. Because Joanne decided not to tell anyone that she was pregnant, no one was quite sure how far gone she was that April night, but from what she did tell her cousin, it would seem that she was at least six months gone. The silence that surrounded Joanne and her life was symptomatic of the culture of silence in Ireland, and contributed directly to the mystery of both Joanne's baby boy and the Cahir Syveen baby found a few miles away. Ireland in the early 80s was a very different place. The country was heading into an awful recession, and it was very conservative. Ireland was still a very religious place. The Pope had just visited, and had preached against contraception, abortion, and divorce, all three of which were still illegal, although they were being campaigned for by the Irish Women's Liberation Movement. There had been in place up until the mid-1970s a marriage bar for Irish women, so that once they were married they could no longer work outside the home. This had been done away with when Ireland entered the EU and had an influx of financial support from that organisation. Contraception was completely illegal in Ireland up until 1979, when a woman took a court case against the state to secure access to contraception to prevent her from becoming pregnant again, as it would risk her health. She argued that there was a privacy within her marriage that she was entitled to, and so she and other married people could now get a prescription for contraception. Many doctors still refused to prescribe, however, 
and not all pharmacists would fill such scripts. Abortion was completely illegal, and at that time the country had just inserted into the Constitution a guarantee of the protection of the life of the unborn. Children being born outside of marriage was taboo and shameful, so much so that often girls who became pregnant outside of marriage, who did not immediately rectify the situation at their local church, were often sent to the Magdalen laundries, homes run by nuns, where they would have their babies. The children would then be given up for adoption, and the women would stay on in order to atone for their sins, sometimes for many years, and sometimes until their death. The last home of its kind in Ireland closed in the mid-1990s. Divorce was illegal until 1996, and though separation was legal, there was very little support for separated mothers, and domestic violence support was unheard of. So in that climate of religious conservatism, it seemed likely that the Cahersivine baby had been murdered and abandoned by one of these loose women, these unmarried mothers, that skirted the edges of Irish society. And that's where the police focused their efforts. Joanne seemed a likely suspect, pregnant and then not pregnant, and no one was sure where the baby had gone. April 30th was Joanne's birthday, and she had returned to work at the leisure complex. She briefly met Jeremiah Locke that morning and congratulated him on the birth of the new baby, and told him that she had had a miscarriage. The police were beginning to narrow in on Joanne because of her quote-unquote loose morals, and began looking into any other relationships she might have had outside her relationship with Jer Locke. They began preparing for bringing her into the station for questioning, but they were cautious because of the perceived volatile nature of a woman's behaviour around the time of childbirth. On May 1st, Joanne, and eventually the entire Hayes family, was taken into the local Garda station for questioning. Joanne was collected from her work and brought to the station. Gardy arrived at the farmhouse and firstly took her brothers and her Aunt Bridie to the station, with Kathleen following later, leaving her mother Mary behind to mind Yvonne, who was not yet one year old. Garda Maloney arranged for two neighbours to come by the farm to milk the cows. Her friends from the sports centre were even brought in. The woman she shared receptionist duties with admitted that she knew Joanne had been pregnant, but that she hadn't really discussed it with her, as Joanne didn't want to talk about the subject. She also stated that she didn't think Joanne was capable of what had been done to the Cahersivine baby. Initially, Joanne denied everything, but within half an hour, she told the guardie that she had had her baby in the field outside of the farmhouse and that he had never lived. She panicked and put his body in a bag at a stream near the house. She told them exactly where they would find the baby, and Gardy were sent out to the field to look. They found nothing. Her family also initially said that they knew nothing, only that she had been in the hospital. Those that knew she had been pregnant didn't ask what had happened to the baby. But after hours of questioning, their stories all changed. They all told how Joanne had had the baby in her bedroom, that most of the family members had been in and out of the room at various points during the night, that Joanne had stabbed her baby and hit it over the head with a toilet brush. Her brothers confessed that they had taken the baby and had put it in a fertilizer bag and driven miles away to the coast at a place called Slee Head and had thrown the bag into the ocean. The brothers identified the bags found on the beach as the same kind that they used to put the small body into before throwing him into the sea. Aunt Bridie said that she had helped to deliver the baby. There were discrepancies in the statements, however. Joanne had said that no one was present when she stabbed the baby. Bridie had said she knew nothing of the death of the baby. But the two brothers had put her in the room when it happened. There were various accounts as to who was in the car that drove to Slee Head and at what time they arrived back at the farm. That night, Joanne was charged and taken into custody. She was then transferred to a mental facility, where she stayed for two weeks. The Garda murder squad had, in the space of a few days, conducted an investigation that led to the arrest of a suspect in the murdered and abandoned Kerry baby case. They had managed to get confessions from everybody about what had happened that night. There was only one problem. Shortly after the confessions were signed and Joanne was charged, the body of the baby she had given birth to was found on the farm in Abidorney. The next day, on May 2nd, Kathleen and her brothers headed to the place that Joanne had told them she had hidden the baby, and when they spotted the plastic bag that Joanne had described to them, Kathleen informed the Gardaí at Abidorney. So how was it that Joanne and members of her family had confessed to murdering and disposing of a body of a newborn which was dumped off the coast? Initially, to the Gardaí, there was only one obvious solution. Joanne had given birth to twins. The Gardaí needed to find some scenario that made both babies Joanne's and kept the confessions that they had taken statements of accurate. So it was told that Joanne had two baby boys, one that was dumped on the farmland and another that was stabbed and thrown into the sea. Blood tests would later show that it was highly unlikely that this was the case. Joanne and Jeremiah were both blood type O and the Cahersivine baby was blood type A. One of his parents would have to have had that blood type in order for it to be passed on to the infant. So the story grew more wild. Joanne had had twins, but the twins had had different fathers. It was a condition known as superfecundation, which is incredibly rare. Given what were perceived as Joanne's loose morals, the Gardaí thought that it was likely that she would have been sleeping with more than one man. 
and if she had done this within a short period of one another, 24 to 48 hours, it was possible that each man had fertilized one egg, making her pregnant with twins, but by two different fathers. Alternatively, there had been yet another baby that had been strangled and stabbed to death and disposed of at Slea Head, and that baby had simply yet to be found. It was not unheard of to charge someone with murder without the body of the deceased. The physical evidence of the so-called crime also did not add up. The fertilizer bag that played such a large role in the confessions of the Hayes family had no traces of being in contact with the deceased infant. There was no evidence of blood in Joanne's bed, where she said she had given birth and stabbed the child, though there were two nightdresses that had an amount of blood on them. One even had traces of hay, and her underwear was found to have bloodstains as well. It was also found to be extremely unlikely that anything thrown into the sea at Slay Head would have ended up on the beach at Cash Syvene, as the tides flow in the opposite direction. The question of whether Joanne could be charged with the murder of the baby boy found on the farm was briefly raised, but the pathologist couldn't say definitively that quote-unquote separate existence had been achieved, that is, that the baby had breathed on his own. The autopsy revealed that the boy's lungs had not fully expanded, which threw some doubt on the question. The Gardaí sent their file to the Office of the Director for Public Prosecutions, but that office refused to pursue the case, and on the 10th of October the charges against Joanne were finally dropped. The police had waited to inform the Hayes family of this until the last minute, though it was generally known no charges would be pursued in what the DPP called a quote-unquote amazing case as early as two weeks before. Two days after the charges were formally dropped, journalists who had been investigating the Garda Heavy Gang published an article questioning whether there had been inappropriate techniques in the questioning of the Hayes family. It was an issue that was in the public consciousness at the time. A few months before, a man had died of injuries he sustained in police custody in County Cavan, and questions were being raised about the methods used by the murder squad. The Hayeses now said that they had been coerced, and that the confessions that they had given were due to the excessive use of force and psychological terror. This prompted an internal investigation of the affair. The Hayes family refused to come in for questioning about the matter, and instead sent statements to the Gardaí through their lawyers. Joanne stated that she had asked at least once every half hour to be taken out to the farm, but they never took her for fear that she might become unstable. Joanne said that they told her that Yvonne would be sent to an orphanage if she didn't confess what she'd done. When she said she'd felt sick, they put a newspaper on the floor and told her that she could vomit on that. While her statement was being written out, she was put sitting on one of the guardies' laps. She was told that infanticide was not considered murder and that she would likely only get a suspended sentence for the stabbing. They insisted that they were being fatherly towards her. Her brother Ned alleged that the police had told him to get on his knees and say an act of contrition, and that he had been upended from his kneeling position by one guard, who had then tried to grab his groin. Mike said that another policeman had grabbed him around the neck in a headlock, and had pretended to punch him repeatedly. Mike had a learning difficulty. He was frightened. They told him that he would never work on the farm again, and the farm was his life. He hardly left it. The police denied these allegations also. Kathleen said that she had been slapped over the backside of her head, and told that she would be committed to a mental hospital if she didn't confess to her part in the murder of the baby. She was asked how she had voted in the most recent referendum. Was she truly a pro-life supporter? These actions were again denied by the Gardaí. Mary Hayes said that she had been told what to say outright for her statement, and that she had said it to stop the questioning. Again, this was denied. The whole family said that they had felt that they had been under arrest. They were never informed that they could leave the police station at any point. But the guards said that they had been free to leave, and that their presence at the station was purely voluntary. At the internal inquiry, many of the individual Gardaí refused to answer the allegations, and the investigation was stymied and came to a close. There was a huge media interest in the case, and after the failed Garda investigation, the outcry was such that the Minister for Justice decided to set up a judicial inquiry into it. The tribunal was chaired by Mr Justice Kevin Lynch, and met for the first time on the 28th of December 1984. It was decided that the hearings would begin on the 7th of January 1985 in Tralee, the nearest large town, and that it was estimated to last about three weeks. There was no guarantee of legal costs for those that participated, so both the Gardaí involved and the Hayes family scraped together money to ensure that they were represented. The team that the Hayes secured had dealt only with minor civil issues up until this point. Their barrister had only just returned to the courts after a period of illness, and had almost exclusively worked on employment tribunal cases. The tribunal was set up to find out how the police had conducted themselves while interviewing the Hayes family, to inquire into the circumstances of bringing and then dropping charges, the allegations made by the Hayes family against the police, and any other matter deemed relevant by the judge. The judge took these guidelines to mean that he was inquiring into the circumstances surrounding the birth of Joanne Hayes's baby, where the birth had taken place, whether there was one baby or two, and the allegations made against the police by the Hayes family. Joanne's friends and family were called to give evidence, followed by Jeremiah Locke. Her friends told of how they knew that Joanne had been pregnant and agreed that she had lied to them by telling them or leading them to believe that she had miscarried in hospital. 
one of the women, Peggy Houlihan, was asked by counsel for the Garda superintendents what excuse she had for being out and having drinks with a married man when she was a married woman herself. She was asked who would make supper for her husband if she was out. The women were all asked if they knew a man by the name of Tom Flynn. The name had been written in pen on Joanne's bed frame and the Gardaí's legal team were trying to ascertain if this could be the other lover that Joanne had had. The women all responded that they didn't know Tom Flynn, but the townsfolk knew who Tom Flynn was. He had owned a furniture business in the area, but had emigrated in the 1960s when Joanne was 10 years old. This was eventually brought to the attention of the court. Soon after hearing from Joanne's friends and her employer, Jeremiah Locke gave evidence. He told the tribunal about himself, and he admitted that he had been in a relationship with Joanne. He said that he had loved her, in a way, but that he was married. The Gardaí's barrister then took him through all the locations that he could remember having sex with Joanne in, complete with an ordnance survey map. When the judge interrupted and asked what exactly the point of listing these locations and showing them on the map was, the barrister, Mr. Kennedy, stated that it went to Joanne Hayes' sexual history and that he was going to show that if she had had sex with others, it was not only possible, but probable that Ms. Hayes had been impregnated by two men with different blood types at around the same time and that this had resulted in two baby boys, both of whom Joanne had killed. On that basis, the judge allowed the line of questioning to continue. Jeremiah Locke was asked if they had sex every time he gave Joanne a lift home, whether they had used contraception, whether it was a problem that his wife and Joanne were pregnant at the same time, and whether he thought that it was possible that Joanne saw Yvonne as a compromise, as he wouldn't leave his wife for her. He had no complaints of how he had been treated by the Gardaí when he had been questioned on the 1st of May, except that they, quote, spoke hard to him. The Hayes family were then brought in one by one to give their testimony. Justice Kevin Lynch seemed taken aback that the family either had no idea what was going on and that Joanne was pregnant, or that they knew she had been pregnant and never asked what happened that night and what had become of the baby. Her sister Kathleen said that she presumed that the others in her family knew that Joanne had had the baby and that she was waiting for Joanne to bring up what had happened. She said that if Joanne had never decided to bring it up, she would never have brought it up herself either. The women of the family all confirmed that it was just how they communicated. They were a family of very few words. The brothers relied on Kathleen to tell them everything that they needed to know. They knew about the affair with Jeremiah Locke, but they also knew that Joanne was 23 and she was an adult. And what's more, she was the only person in receipt of a paycheck in the household. They all knew that there was a problem, but there was nothing to be done about it, so they kept their peace. Her aunts, Joan and Sister Aquinas, wrote to her after they were told Joanne was pregnant with Yvonne and tried to convince her to put the child up for adoption. But Joanne refused and both of them let it go. Sister Aquinas wrote, quote, I'm not your mother. I hope you haven't taken offence. Let us carry on as we have always carried on, end quote. Each family member was made to account for their actions or inactions in their reaction to Joanne's second pregnancy. Each family member stated that they had not known she was pregnant again, except in Kathleen. The rest, who said that they hadn't known, were met with disbelief. It was suggested that the family was afraid to acknowledge the fact that Joanne was pregnant again due to the social stigma associated with it. After all, she already had one illegitimate child, and with a nun and a priest's housekeeper for aunts in a rural town, they were ashamed. The family members recalled what they had done that day. Mike had tended to the farm, Ned had been replacing windows in the council cottage, Kathleen had been doing housework and minding Yvonne, Joanne had been in bed with stomach pains most of the day. Their mother Mary was sick in bed with the flu and Auntie Bridie was mostly nocturnal, so she wouldn't wake up to take her place in the kitchen until the rest of the family had gone to bed that evening. Just as everyone was preparing for bed, Joanne came into the kitchen and said that she wanted to get some fresh air and asked Kathleen to change Yvonne's nappy. The kitchen was empty then, everyone having gone to bed, and with Bridie yet to have gotten up. After sitting with Yvonne for a while, Kathleen went to the kitchen door and called out to Joanne. It was dark and Kathleen couldn't see her, but Joanne replied that she would be in in a minute. She went back to the bedroom with Yvonne and only left again when she heard Joanne come back into the house. Joanne had headed straight for the bathroom though, and Kathleen saw drops of blood on the kitchen floor. She said Joanne was looking for sanitary towels, she was bleeding heavily, and she had told Kathleen that she was having a heavy period. They all returned to the bedroom and lay down, eventually going off to sleep. Joanne recounted how she had gotten up the next morning at around 5am and gone out to where she had had the baby the night before. He was lying in some hay. She placed him in a bag and brought him across the field near to the stream and put the bag under a bramble that was near to a pool of water. She went back to the farmhouse and went back to sleep. Kathleen woke up and started to go about her daily chores. She brought a cup of tea to her mother in bed and told her that Joanne had miscarried the baby the night before. She brought Joanne a cup of tea at around 10am when she woke up and watched later as Joanne left the house with tongs and went off into the field. Kathleen went out to check the surrounding area and she found what looked like two pools of blood. She also found a bag that was full of gravel, which shifted and spilt out when she nudged it with her foot. She got scared, though, and returned to the farmhouse.
Joanne continued to hemorrhage throughout the day and was eventually convinced to see a doctor and then go to the hospital. No one at the hospital queried what had happened to her or to her baby, and the family continued in silence thereafter. Joanne finally took the stand three weeks later and was asked to give details of the night of April 13th. She was asked about her hemorrhaging, her sexual history and partners, and she was asked to describe finding out that Mary Locke was pregnant at the same time she was. She had to describe in detail the ordeal of having her baby out in the field, delivering the baby standing up and catching him with her hands. She described the pain that she was in, and was forced to describe her baby's appearance the next morning when she moved him to the pool of water. Joanne had a hard time giving evidence. She broke down crying a number of times. At one point, she asked to be excused and became ill in the toilets. She was shaking and hyperventilating and vomiting. She had to be sedated. The judge decided, however, that it would be better for everyone involved for her to get her testimony over and done with, and so asked her to resume the witness box and continue to give evidence despite her heavy sedation. Her speech was slurred, and she kept her eyes closed and her head propped on the microphone for the rest of the testimony that day. People were outraged, especially the women of Ireland. On the morning of Wednesday the 20th of January, the first yellow flower was sent to Joanne and was delivered to her at the courthouse. The first woman was local and was joined by two other flowers that day. Overnight, more flowers were arranged, some from individuals, many from feminist and women's groups that wanted to show their support for Joanne and express their disgust at the very public forum that her most private moments were being discussed in. Women from Dublin and Galway and Cork rang the florist in Tralee and ordered single yellow flowers wrapped in cellophane to be delivered to the courthouse in Tralee for Joanne Hayes. Individuals sent cards and letters of support to Joanne. In typical Irish fashion, mass cards were sent to her, promising that masses would be said in her name and that she would be in the prayers of the sender and the religious organisations that the cards were purchased from. Some of the letters were incredibly personal, the writers telling Joanne their own stories. Even some of the religious orders in the country supported Joanne, a nun arrived to the courthouse with a card signed by a whole convent for her. Hundreds of flowers, letters and cards arrived for Joanne. It was as if the public examination of Joanne's life allowed the silence that had surrounded the issues faced by unmarried mothers or people whose lives had taken them out of the fold of their communities to be lifted, at least for a time. The protests began when two Abbey Dorney locals, John Barrett and Jerome Donovan, arranged for the locals to show their support of Joanne outside the courthouse. They saw what was going on in the tribunal as a proxy trial of Joanne and thought that this was the best way to both show their anger and displeasure for the proceedings and to show support for the Hayes family. They arrived with banners and signs. The day after, the small demonstration was expanded to include women's groups that travelled from all over the country. A bus was hired to bring women from Dublin down to Tralee, a 200-mile trip. The women were from various community groups, from political groups like Sinn Féin and the Socialist Movement, to a group of women from a group that were learning to read and write. For many, it was their first demonstration. Mothers and grandmothers, sisters and aunts had turned out to support Joanne and to show their disgust for the way she was being treated. The crowd gathered outside the building went quiet when Joanne and the Hayes family came out of the courthouse. They were there to support her, but they didn't want to intrude into this painful moment in her life either. One older woman finally broke the divide and hugged Mary Hayes. The rest of the women held out their flowers and cards for Joanne, but soon her arms were full, and then so were Kathleen's, and then the brothers. When the Hayeses went to a local hotel, the legal teams began to make their way out of the building. The judge was booed. In response, he smirked. The crowd soon became a procession and made its way to the Garda station where they chanted and sang. Slowly, the crowd dispersed. Some went to a pub that they had hired for the night and others took part in a press conference before heading back to their respective parts of the country. When the tribunal resumed the next Monday, Justice Lynch described the crowd as, quote, raucous, ignorant urban dwellers, end quote, and threatened to find any other demonstrators in contempt of court for obstructing the tribunal. He also remarked that he had seen a photo in one of the weekend newspapers showing Bridie at home. She had had a stroke when she had been in hospital, and the tribunal had been told that she was not fit to give evidence. The judge wondered if she was fit enough to be let home, then surely she was fit enough to come in and give her account to the tribunal. But that afternoon, Bridie had a second stroke and returned to hospital. The next Wednesday, on the 30th of January, Mr Justice Lynch returned to the subject of Bridie again. He was most anxious to hear from her. After discussing whether she was of sound mind and whether she might be able to manage all the steps in the courthouse, Lynch quickly adjourned the tribunal to visit the hospital and to see for himself if Bridie Fuller could give evidence. There was a rush of lawyers, guardy and journalists from the courthouse to the hospital, where they heard from Bridie's doctor that she was brain damaged and paralysed. The judge was not content with this answer, however, and pushed to establish whether Bridie's intellect had been affected by the stroke she had suffered. He was told that, although she was probably incapable of taking legal advice, she might be capable of, for instance, making a will. This satisfied the judge and he decided that with some time, Bridie would recover enough to give evidence. 
the tribunal returned to Tralee. Bridie was represented by the same legal team as the rest of the Hayes family, but she had never spoken to any of the lawyers as she was not well enough. However, she had not been formally excused from the proceedings because she would have had to have been seen by a psychiatrist and they couldn't afford to hire one. So the lawyers were representing someone who not only had not attended the tribunal, but someone that they hadn't even spoken to. And Bridie was the only one of the Hayes family that seemed to stick to the story that she had told the Gardaí on the 1st of May 1984. Joanne's brother Mike, who had a learning disability, had also insisted that one, he didn't know Joanne had been pregnant, and two, that she had given birth in the house. On Wednesday the 6th of February, Bridie was judged fit to give evidence, and the tribunal made its way out to the hospital, where she was a patient. No members of the public were allowed to attend, and only four journalists were present for her evidence. The Hayes family were sure that Bridie had simply fixated on the story of Joanne giving birth in the bedroom, and like a recording, was just repeating the troubling story over and over. Under questioning from the lawyers, she agreed that that was what she remembered, and that she had helped to deliver Joanne's baby, and that she had in fact cut the umbilical cord. The questions from senior counsel were leading for the most part, and she even seemed to agree that Joanne had given birth to twins that night. There was much discussion about how Bridie had cut the umbilical cord. The Cahar Syveen baby's cord had been cut flush with his abdomen, and the baby found at Abby Dorney had a much longer cord. Bridie said that she had left the cord long, the baby was weak. Much was made of this discussion, but as was pointed out by her sister Joan, Bridie had never been present at a delivery before, despite being a nurse for many years, so she had no expertise on the matter. There was also a question as to, if Joanne was telling the truth and had given birth out in the field, how had the umbilical cord been cut? Had Joanne brought a scissors out with her? If so, was there an element of premeditation about her baby's death? Evidence was given that she could have simply torn it, and evidence was given that she could not have. Nothing conclusive was reached on the matter. However, the state pathologist concluded, due to the examination of the cord and its blood vessels, that whether it had been cut or torn, it was done after death. Finally, the tribunal turned to consider whether it was indeed possible that Joanne had been pregnant with twins, delivered one in the field, and had the other disposed of by her brothers in the sea at Slea Head. They considered how pregnant the slightly built, four-foot, nine-inch woman could have looked at around eight months gone. The judge added up all the approximate weights of the babies, the placenta, etc., and decided that if she had been carrying twins, it would have been quite obvious to most people that she was pregnant, and indeed carrying twins. The pathologist stated that this was a nonsense, and each woman carries a pregnancy differently to the next. It was impossible to know if you could tell by looking at Joanne that she was pregnant, just by doing some maths. The lawyers also tried to establish that Joanne was, quote, the sort of woman to carry on with multiple men, end quote, in order to support the twins' hypothesis. They spoke to the psychiatrist who had seen Joanne in jail, and who had had her admitted to the mental facility. He said that she was depressed and sad, and possibly suicidal at the time. He acknowledged when questioned that some women have mental disturbances around the time of birth. He thought that Joanne loved Jeremiah Locke, and said that he gave her the benefit of the doubt that she hadn't killed her baby. He'd examined her again that year and said that she was a bright and cheerful woman who had some guilt about what had happened, though not as much as he might have thought she would. Another psychiatrist was called that never actually examined Joanne and was only able to speak from what he had read in the papers. He concluded that Joanne was actually enjoying the attention that the tribunal had brought her and said that she was a classic example of princess victim syndrome, that being she was a victim of the tribunal and a princess in the media. The tribunal dealt with all sorts of things in the months that followed while they waited for the expert on super fecundation to arrive in from the UK, the way the tidal currents flowed along the southwest coast, whether Joanne could have gotten over the wall between the field and the river. This warranted a trip by the judge to the farm to see if he could do it, and the tribunal even discussed threatening letters that the judge had received. Finally, five months after the tribunal hearing began, the expert arrived from Britain. He delivered his expertise. The idea that Joanne could have had twins with two different fathers was so rare that it was impossible. This whole notion of twins could be ruled out. With that advice delivered, the summing up began. It was interrupted, however, when Marguerite Egan of a local women's group approached the judge and laid an envelope in front of him. It contained a submission on behalf of the women of Ireland. The judge asked, quote, what have I got to do with the women of Ireland? End quote. Amongst other things, the submission recommended the abolition of all male tribunals. Finally, on the 4th of October, Mr. Justice Kevin Lynch released his findings of the tribunal. Though he stated that Joanne was not the mother of the Cahersivine baby, he condemned her and her family as barefaced liars who had misled the Gardaí and perjured themselves. He exonerated the police force in any wrongdoing in their investigation. He never answered the central question to be asked by the tribunal, what had caused the Hayes family to confess to crimes that they did not commit in such a convincing manner. Justice Lynch found that they had in fact been telling the truth about the circumstances of the birth of Joanne's baby, that she had had the baby in the house and had been assisted by her family members. They had only added in the stabbing and the trip to Slay Head in order to coincide with the circumstances of the Cahersivine baby. These stories were seemingly made up independent of one another 
despite the fact that the newspapers had never reported that the body of the Cahersivin baby had been stabbed. According to the report, it was not the Gardaí's fault that the family had thought that they were unable to leave the station that day. He did criticise the Gardaí in that they brought charges against Joanne even after the baby had been found on the farm and had preferred to try and make a fantastical scenario play out to fit the evidence that they had. They should have let it go, but they didn't. The judge was very careful to ensure that in his report he did not state that Joanne had killed her baby or committed any crime. There was no proof of that, but he skirted this issue very closely and left the public with the impression that she had choked the infant and hit it with a brush. Perhaps it was the fear and silence in the house that led to whatever happened that night in the farmhouse, with no way to get help, no phone, and no one to drive the car. Mary Locke was named by the judge as the most wronged woman in the affair. However, when she was approached by the media for her response, she stated that, quote, Joanne Hayes was treated harshly, end quote. It's unlikely that we will ever know what occurred on the farm outside Abbey Dorney that night. Likewise, the baby boy that was abandoned to the sea has never been identified. His grave gives him the name John, and the mystery of the Kerry babies lives on. Thank you for listening to the Men's Rea podcast. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe, rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at Men's Rea Pod. And you can send in questions, comments or topic suggestions to mensreapod at gmail.com. I'd like to take a moment to thank our very first sponsor on Patreon, Dara Matten. Thank you, Dara. Your support means a lot and helps to defray some of the production costs of the podcast. If you'd like to sponsor the podcast, head on over to www.patreon.com mensreapod. I'd also like to thank our five-star reviewers on Apple Podcasts. Thanks to Gemma G0000 and Zoe Bellman for your encouragement. I really appreciate it. Our theme song is Quinn's Song First Dance by Kevin McLeod. This podcast is researched, written, and produced by me, your host, Sinead. All sources for today's episode can be found on our website, www.mensreapod.com, or in the show notes. Until next time, don't do anything I wouldn't do. <laughs>